All right, how are we doing? Pretty good? I'm glad to see you. Did you have a good weekend? Pretty good weekend? It was pretty good? Can you see clearly? All right, good. So we're actually starting on time, guys. It's 6.35. I'm finally getting the hang of things. We're starting on time. And hopefully we're gonna be a, a lot more efficient than, um, than before. So today uh, we've got a couple of things we need to do. Finish going through the syllabus so you know exactly what's coming. That's gonna be pretty quick. Then we're gonna hop into the reading for today. It's gonna be a, an overview of the value and meaning of philosophy. That was your first reading from the textbook. We're gonna go over that. And then finally, we're gonna finish off with the supplementary notes that I had to read, all right? So we have a lot to do. We have an hour and 15 minutes, but here goes nothing. All right, so guys, any general, um, any general issues with either accessing recordings or with the course or anything like that? Anything that needs to be brought to my attention? Yeah. All right, sure, I'll start working on that. Did you go to the bookstore? No, cheaper online. Cheaper online, okay. Did any of you get it from the bookstore? Everybody got it online? Does everyone have it? How many people have it? Raise your hand. Okay, excellent. All right, so I'll start looking into that. I've got to double check copyright issues and then actual sources, but give me, give me like a day or two. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Any other issue? All right, great guys. So you, you guys know that I try to inspire you every time we meet to make sure you see exactly why this stuff is relevant and why you should care about it. Okay. So I just want to emphasize something before we get into the meat of today's topic. And I'm going to try and stay over here so that the sound quality is always good. I just want to emphasize something. Guys, what we're calling metaphysics and all this stuff, it might seem like a dry, logical exercise or very technical, but I just want to remind you it's super, super relevant. What we're calling the metaphysics, what we're calling metaphysics, the study of ultimate reality and all that, I want to give you a little insight. This thing called metaphysics didn't exist before a certain philosopher called Aristotle. What Aristotle did is he did a thorough comprehensive study of all of nature and all of culture. And he arranged his books in a certain order. So he had one book called Physics, where he studied nature and its physical aspect. But then he had another group of books, which he called the metaphysics. The metaphysics were studying not nature in its ordinary sense, but what should come first before you even study nature. So metaphysics means beyond physics, beyond the physical, okay? Now, why is this very interesting? Well, remember those branches of philosophy I was telling you about last class? It's very, very interesting, right? I was telling you things like, okay, ultimate reality could be God, right? God technically doesn't appear in many religious traditions. He's invisible. So the metaphysical could also be the same as the what? The supernatural, right? So religion and metaphysics might overlap. What we call metaphysics might be the same as what religious people would call the supernatural, the miraculous, the psychic, all this kind of, you know. You know, metaphysics also means things like for people who follow new age spirituality, it means like psychic, psychic abilities, the ability to read minds, the ability to you know, make things levitate. You know, you, you catch my drift, right? Astrology, all that kind of thing. In the modern reinterpretation of what metaphysics is, it involves all kinds of spirituality. That's new age. So metaphysics and the supernatural and things like God and spirituality, 
they all line up. They could all coincide. I'm not saying they do coincide, but they could coincide. But what Aristotle is studying when he studies metaphysics might turn out to be the same as what other you know, religious people are calling God or spirituality, those kinds of things, right? And it could also turn out to be that other metaphysical thing I was telling you about. Because look at the physical, right? What, what appears? Well, we typically say that what appears is physical things, things that can be sensed by our senses. Those are physical things, not metaphysical ones, but physical ones. So that means anything that's not showing up physically is technically metaphysical. So that includes God, maybe. Maybe God doesn't appear, maybe he does. But it also includes what? We look at ourselves right now. What do we see? What do we call these things? Your classmates. What, what technically do you see? Bodies, right? You see bodies. Is that the only thing that your classmates are? And is that the only thing you are? What else is missing? What else is metaphysical about yourself and other people? Minds, very good. So God is metaphysical and minds are metaphysical. Everything that we call psychology, the psychological is technically metaphysical. Think about that. I just want you to think about that. There's a significant part of you that is super mysterious. And it's true, after science got very empirical and sophisticated and we have all these ways of measuring things using technology, it's true. We started to study the mind and we started to think that we understand it. We understand its organization. There was a famous German philosopher called Wilhelm Wundt from the uh, 19th century. Some people call him the founder of cognitive psychology or the founder of scientific psychology. Many people say that's when we started to measure the mind scientifically. What do we mean by measure the mind? Well, you say things like, hey, Take these seven numbers. I'm going to give you my phone number. Take these seven numbers and memorize them. And then you start measuring. How long can you remember them? Things like that, right? You're measuring memory. Or you measure perception. Or you measure imagination. Or you measure attention. Or you measure consciousness. Right? So what is science doing? It's beginning to measure the mind. It's beginning to measure the metaphysical. Interesting, right? Can you measure the metaphysical? The physical, we can measure because it's physical. But can you really measure the metaphysical? Something to think about. Can you, measure, can you measure something that's not even physical? You use SI units and metric system to measure things that are measurable, physical things. Can you really measure a soul or a spirit or a mind? I want you to think about that, OK? Just keep it in your mind. Because people like Aristotle, they had a very sophisticated psychology. They studied the soul and the mind, but they didn't measure it the same way we do, with you know, very technical instruments in terms of seconds and meters and kilograms. They didn't do that. Someone like Plato, who was Aristotle's master and teacher, in my opinion, he's an expert psychologist, because he says, the soul is made up of different activities. The soul is very active. Unlike matter, matter is passive and inert, right? You take in physics, what's Newton's first law? The law of what? You almost got it. Yeah, he did study gravity. You're absolutely right. But there's something else. He has three laws of motion. The first Newtonian law of motion is the law of inertia. It says all physical things have this quality called inertia. To be material is to be passive. You understand what I'm saying? Passive? What is passive? If you put it here, it will what? Stay right there unless you apply a force to it. You see that? Does that make sense? That's passive. Minds, on the other hand, are not passive. They're super active. They're constantly engaging in what I was telling you earlier. Activities like what? Perception. That's an activity. To perceive is to be active. Memory. That's an activity. 
Consciousness, that's an activity. Imagination, that's an activity. Attention, that's an activity. You see what I'm saying? I want you to seriously consider whether or not a mere body could engage in activities like that. Activities like consciousness, memory, perception. Can a body do that? Can we study how the body does that? I think I told you guys I went to Johns Hopkins, right? I studied neuroscience there. According to neuroscience, according to some many neuroscientists, they have this dogma. The brain equals the what? Brain is same as what? What would a neuroscientist say? That your brain is the same as your? Your mind. Your mind is your brain and your brain is your mind. That's what they say. They believe that. Why would they believe that? Well, they have some reason to. They are associated. If you get in a bad accident and you injure your brain, you will begin to have effects in your mind, right? So there's something going on that associates them. But sometimes they go too far and they say, okay, there is what we call mind-brain identity. Mind is just equal to brain. No sophistication, no nothing. What it is to be mind is to be the brain. And therefore, whatever electrochemical patterns of neural activity we have in the brain, somehow that's gonna be equal to, identical to what? Perception, memory, imagination, consciousness. See that? The activities of the brain, some people interpret those as being identical to the activities of the mind or the soul. I want you to think deeply about how that's possible, if it's possible. It's something to think about. So I was telling you about Plato. Plato was an expert psychologist in my view, because he saw even before Aristotle that whatever the mind is, it's gotta be super duper active. And he saw all these activities in the, mi in the mind going on in the soul. He saw that we have a part of our soul called appetites. Right? The body has to sustain itself, so it's constantly consuming food and drink, right? Those are appetites, very active. That's an activity of the soul, according to um, Plato. But it's a low-level activity. If you live your life at that level of activity, you're living a relatively unconscious life. It's like living a life of a drug addict or something, or a food addict, or a sex addict, right? That's a low-level way of living. Above that, you have the more spirited um, part of the soul, the part of the soul that takes courage and fights, right? So Plato is an aristocrat in classical Athens, and he definitely sees that we need more than farmers and merchants and commerce and industry. We also need fighters to defend the city-state, to defend Athens against Sparta and the Persians, right? So we need a separate part of the city completely disconnected from the appetitive part of the city. And he saw that reflected in the soul. We need a part of the soul that feeds the body and attends to the body. But since the body is inferior, to live a life totally dedicated to appetites, you won't, you won't be very woke. You won't be very conscious. You'll be living like a beast or an animal or even a plant. Above that, though, is the courage side of the soul. That's another activity, right? The spirited side, the side that faces challenges, defends and fights and protects. That's more conscious, but not the highest. Above all of them is reason, using your mind to contemplate, using your intellect to understand things. So that's the structure of the soul according to Plato. Mind or reason ruling the spirit which rules the appetites. I think that's an expert psychologist. That's who we are. That's what we are. We're a bunch of appetites. We have the ability to control those appetites using the spirit or the spirited side of us. We also can defend ourselves. And then we use reason or intellect to govern it all. And so each one of these has a virtue associated with it. For the appetites, the virtue they need to master is self-control. Appetites can get to uh, too out of control, too uh, gluttonous, too much of a sex addict, things like that. So to control the appetites, 
that virtue is called temperance. And that's another activity. Temperance is an activity of the soul. Self-control is an activity of the soul. In addition, you have courage. If you're a warrior, then your main virtue is being courageous, not being cowardly, not being timid, and also not being reckless, but being somewhere in the middle, having courage. And then finally, above all, you have reason. Its virtue is wisdom. Wisdom guides the entire thing and decides what's appropriate and what's not, what are the priorities that you have as the soul and how it should be governed. But there's another special virtue that has to do with the connection between all of these structures of the soul. And that virtue is called justice. And that's the virtue of each part doing its own part and not doing the job of another one. When the appetites decide to rule and put wisdom down, then you've lost your priorities and you now have an unhealthy soul, a diseased soul. See that? So justice is a very special virtue for Plato. It's the supreme virtue. It's, it's a very Greek virtue. The, 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 Greek, the, the idea of everything being ordered and everything being harmonious, everything acting in harmony, everything being balanced and measured and in proportion with everything else. Very Greek aesthetic sensibility. That's a cultural thing, not just a philosophical thing. Got it? All right. So I wanted to just bring those deep, deep things to you so that you can see that philosophy is some deep, deep stuff. Now, there's this other issue that I wanted to bring up, this issue of cares. Remember I was telling you about how, as a human being, one of the most beautiful things about us is that we care. I think that's a deep, deep part. You know, the humanity studies what it is to be human in a very intimate way. And that's what film studies and drama, Netflix shows, Hulu, all of that, Broadway, all of that is studying the human being at a very deep level. And I want to suggest to you, just think about your favorite show, your favorite movie or whatever. Think about it in terms of the theme of care. Look at how the artist or the writer, or the filmmaker, the director, is showing care. Care in the development of his characters and care in the plot. Just think about that. I want to suggest to you that perhaps the most human aspect of us is our care. Some philosophers have gone to say that our essence is care. If you look at all of our activity, they're all guided by care. All that perception and memory, all of that is care all that reason and spirit and appetite, all of those are forms of care. His name was Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, a German philosopher from the last century. He said, to be human is to care, to be made to care. And everything you do, you care. And so I shared with you some of those cares, you know? When you're really young, oh well, man, you're immature, you care about, you know, being popular with your friends and, you know, you care about playing your favorite sport or video game all day. But as you get older, life starts to get a bit serious, right? Things get, cares get heavier. They're not so ridiculous. <laughs> you know, they're not so humorous. They're not so lighthearted. Things get a bit serious. All of a sudden, you have a spouse, and you care about them. You've got children. You care about their health and their education. You've got parents who are getting older. They're dependent on you now. You used to be dependent on them. They're becoming dependent on you. Life is starting to become a serious affair, a very serious affair. All of a sudden, you're a citizen, right? You care about politics. You care about who's in your government. You've got an economy, right? You've got a career. You can't, you can't just slack off. You've got to care about which career is the best one for you and for your kids. And you've got to care about work-life balance. You've got to care about your relationships, your neighborhood and then your church, your business, all sorts of things. You guys get the point, right? Remember I told you about Schopenhauer? You remember that name Schopenhauer? The philosopher who said, when we zoom into our lives, moment by moment, day by day, and episode by episode, what do we get? A comedy, right? It's pretty lighthearted. It looks like your life is one big joke, and your life looks pretty ridiculous. A stand-up comic or a sitcom could have fun with those moment-by-moment -moment settings. 
But as soon as you zoom out and you look at the whole arc of your life from beginning to end, it looks serious because you go, as the Buddha saw, you go from birth then you start aging, you get all sorts of sicknesses, all those cares start to take hold of your soul. It becomes a burden. You need religion to get through it. And then despite all your efforts, you will decline and you'll get sick in old age and you will die. And that's a very serious affair. That's what we call tragedy. When you look at Scarface, when you look at Godfather, when you look at American Beauty, when you look at Magnolia, when you look at even Goodfellas or Heat, or um, when you look at Macbeth, Othello, Hamlet, or King Lear, when you look at Oedipus Rex, Antigone, or the Oresteia, Prometheus Baum, what is the common theme? Care. People have souls that are being weighed down by cares. That's what makes for a good tragedy. Sometimes you die from your cares. Do you see that? So I want you to explore that theme as we're going through this class. Look for the theme of care. And also entertain the possibility that you do have this thing called a soul. Something more than your body, something metaphysical. Something that may or may not be identical to an oversoul, a god. The Stoics were a group of philosophers who believed that we all share a common soul. It's called God, nature, spirit, reason. So as we're doing metaphysics, there's an interesting question of, okay, there's the metaphysical, but how is it divided? Is there only one metaphysical thing that animates everything? Or are there many metaphysical things? Do each of you have individual minds and souls? Or do we all share one common soul? Keep in mind, I'm not trying to be conclusive. I'm just trying to get you to think. All right. So I think I've covered that as thoroughly as possible. Now I just want to finish up this, the syllabus as soon as possible so we can get into the reading. Is that cool? All right, great. So I remember, if I'm not wrong, where we were last time. We went through the syllabus up till the end of the God section. Do you remember the last philosopher we looked at was Leibniz? Do you remember that? Leibniz was this philosopher, crazy philosopher, genius philosopher. A crazy genius, get used to it, There's a lot of them. These crazy geniuses, they do things like inventing calculus. <laughs> Leibniz invented calculus along with, do you know the other person who invented calculus at the same time? Leibniz published it first, but the other guy invented it first. Any ideas? Newton, Isaac Newton, he invented calculus and so did Leibniz and they got into a little bit of fight of a fight about it but eventually um, they resolved it. So now let's move on to the mind-body problem. We're gonna be looking at a philosopher called Descartes. Descartes is a very great philosopher. He's considered the founder of modern philosophy. Descartes wrote a very special book called The Meditations. He isolated himself and just meditated, kind of like a Buddhist. But this time he was investigating reality. He was doing what he calls first philosophy, metaphysics. What do we need to know first before we can know anything else? We're gonna explore that. And that begins the mind-body problem, which means what? So in, in general pop culture, in folk culture, in our uneducated culture, we say we have bodies and we have minds, but we don't really examine what relationship they have to each other. Our bodies identical to minds. Our bodies different from minds. What are all the different ways that we could fit the puzzle together? Identity, difference. We're gonna see all sorts of different patterns you can create and different ways you can connect them, all right? So we're gonna take a tour of all of those as well as the problems that come up. And it's gonna turn out that the mind-body problem is one of those deep, persistent mysteries about what it is to be human that we still haven't figured out. 
just like we still haven't figured it out exactly whether there's a God, who is God, is it Brahma, Vishnu, Thor, Chris Hemsworth, right? Obviously it's Thor. Um, you know, uh, you know, Krishna, Jesus, Yahweh, who is it? Who is God? So what is this mind? Is it the same as the brain? Is it something else? How would we know? We're going to see. Next, the problem of other minds. Guys, this is a very deep problem. How do you know that these bodies surrounding you have minds? How would you tell? The guy we're reading today, Russell, he also wrote something called the problem of other minds. How in the world do I not know that I'm just not surrounded by a bunch of bodies? How do I not know that I'm the only mind? And all these other people are zombies or something like that. Just bodies rocking around with no inner life. They don't feel pain. They don't feel pleasure. They have no thoughts. How do you know? So we're going to explore that. How do you know that there are other minds than your own? Next. Oh, by the way, do you see that stuff in yellow? Is it self-explanatory? All right, yeah, so those tell you when the essay is due for the following class. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. don't worry. I'll upload it, to, I'll figure out how to give it to you on Blackboard, maybe. Um, yeah, I'll figure out, you'll go and read it, and then you can do your research and write it, and then you submit it somehow. But there is something you have to read. So it'll be like a paragraph and uh, it'll be it'll set you up right you know it'll really give you something to think about some framework to think about and then you bring everything you've taken in the class and you dump it in there you organize it you make it clear and then you give it to me i process it i give it back to you yes sorry louder no, um, you, you do it based off what we did in class, the methods we've, we've looked at, the techniques, and the general spirit that we're kind of trying to approach. But you can do as much external research as you want, so long as it answers the question. It's going to be a real question. You have to respond to that question, but you know, you get to talk. Look, I'm talking about cares, right? So one of the things we, we think we care about is our grades, right? So <laughs> I know that you care about your grades. And I also know that you care about truth, you're curious and things like that. So I just care that you incorporate the spirit and some of the techniques we, we talked about in the class. And you know, it's up to you. I care about what you care about. I just want you to be refined and sophisticated. That's it. All right, the problem of causality, very interesting. This is a deep one, guys. This is one of those heavyweights because it has implications not just for philosophy, but also for science itself. Think carefully about what science says. Science is empirical science. We're going we're gonna to explore what empirical means, but the bottom line is how do you figure out things in the world? How do you figure out laws of nature and that kind of thing? Well, you have to observe nature, right? But that means you have to observe it through your senses. To experience nature is to experience it through the filter of your senses. But there's a problem. How do your senses interact with nature and with experience? If you see the sunrise today, you've observed it, right? And you've got your little notebook and you write down day one, sun rose. Now let's say you've had a series of days when the sun rose. Okay, now we're, we're in dusk, we're waiting for the dawn. If we're gonna make a prediction and say, all right, the sun rose all those other days, am I now justified in terms of epistemology, right? Theory of knowledge, am I justified in saying, I know the sun will rise tomorrow. I can predict that the sun will rise. Do you see the problem? There's a deep, deep problem there. Science, 
makes it seem to some people as if it has everything all figured out. But all it takes is a little bit of philosophical discipline and scrutiny to break the whole thing and say, hold up, wait a minute. Let's go back to epistemology. You're making all these claims, E equals MC squared, F equals MA, all this fancy stuff. You're impressing young minds that haven't learned to think critically yet. Let's think critically now. Under what conditions are those laws of nature like F equals MA and E equals MC squared and stoichiometry, under what conditions are those universal laws? Under what conditions do they apply at all spaces and all times? Do you know tomorrow? Do we know that nature is gonna be the same today as tomorrow? And if we do have some causal law, if one thing causes another, well, okay. So if one thing impacts another and then that thing moves, fine, we might formulate that as a law. Whenever this happens, this other thing happens. But the problem with that is if you're going to make that truly universal and you're going to say every time event A happens, event B happens, guess what you've just done? You've claimed something that you could never experience. What is it? What is that? Necessity. You've said whenever A happens, B necessarily happens. What is necessity? It means it could not happen otherwise. Whenever there's a cause, there's always a certain effect. They always go together and they never are separated. But that's something that goes beyond experience. You could never experience the necessity that binds one event to another. All you can really see is what? One thing following another. But you never get to see the bind between the two that makes them a metaphysical necessary link. Do you see that? We're gonna explore that with a philosopher who was Scottish from the Enlightenment, late, seven, late 18th century. His name was David Hume. All right, moving right along. Free will and determinism. One of the most interesting things about being human is that we make choices and we make decisions. But how does science complicate that? So we've got the first person subjective experience of making decisions and choices and guess what? Society sometimes holds us responsible for those choices, right? If you make certain choices, you could go to jail. You could get punished. So it's a serious affair. So we assume that you have this thing called free will. You can do whatever you want. And on that basis, since you can do whatever you want, we, society, have a right to make you responsible for bad choices. But there's a little problem. Remember that causality I was telling you about? Well, if science studies your body thoroughly and says you're nothing but a body, then what will it discover? It will discover that there are certain things that come after other things in a regular sequence. And if that's true, there's a regular sequence and one thing typically follows another, then we're going to tend to think of you, your body, as a machine, right? And if you're nothing but a machine, well, it gets complicated because do you have free will? Can a machine have free will? Something that's totally automatic, something that runs on nothing but causes and effects that are completely bound to each other. It seems to me that a machine, if we are nothing but machines, then everything about us is completely rigorously determined by laws of nature plus certain starting conditions. So if you take laws of nature and you apply them to the human body through chemistry and physics, that's what you get. You get loss of free will. You get determinism. And that's a huge, huge human problem. You see that? It's one of those mysteries, guys. We haven't figured it out. And again, remember, a lot depends on whether or not we're purely physical. Because if we're not physical, or at least if there's an aspect of us that is metaphysical, that changes everything. Because the laws of nature only apply to the physical side of us. You see that? The metaphysical side might be completely undetermined or unbound. <sighs> that is annoying. Uh, 
I don't know if it's related. Anyway, we'll figure it out. So next after that, we begin to study ethics. Very, very human topic. Guys, can you remind me what ethics is? Do you remember what ethics is? Sorry, I can't hear you. Morals and values. Excellent. That's right. It's still there. You guys have any idea what that might be? Oh, the air? Can someone um, on the back left just touch uh, maybe the air conditioning? Note what number it's on, turn it off, and then turn it back on, maybe? Thank you. All right, I'll note this for next time. I'll ask someone about it. I'm sorry, guys. That's really annoying, but we'll keep going. So yeah, ethics is about moral and morals and values. Ethics is one branch, some might say the most important branch of something called axiology. Axiology is the study of values, where they come from, their nature, and what justifies them, whether they're objective or subjective, all that kind of stuff. There are two branches of it. There's aesthetics, which has to do with beauty and art and taste, and then there's ethics which has to do with being a good and bad person and right and wrong, right and wrong actions. How you figure out whether an action is right or wrong. There are three different uh, schools of thought that we're gonna explore on that uh, issue. One of them is called consequentialism. So the way you figure out whether or not an action is right or wrong, according to consequentialism, is by looking at the actions what? Consequences, excellent. Yep. Does it produce happiness? Does it produce misery? Does it produce chaos? Does it produce order? Does it increase the quality of human life or does it decrease it? We're going to explore that. Then there's another ethic called deontology. Deontology in Greek means the study of duties. So instead of looking at the outcome or the consequences of an action, instead for deontology, you look instead at the motive or the intention behind the action. And therefore, the action is right that's done with the right intention rather than that produces the right consequences. Got it? We're going to study that. And then finally, we're going to look at virtue ethics. Oh, great. Okay. Finally, we're going to look at virtue ethics. Finally, we're going to look at virtue ethics. And virtue ethics is something that says, actually, you know what? Actions are not really the thing we need to be caring about. Instead, we need to be caring about this other very special part of you, the part of you that probably makes you the most. It's called your character. We care about your character, not actions. So deontology and consequentialism are action-oriented or action-centered, and deontology, on the other hand, is person-centered or character-centered. So deontology and consequentialism care about you performing the best action or the right action, but virtue ethics cares about you producing the right, virtue ethics produce, cares about you developing the right character, the best character you can have. And the, the set of dispositions that make up your character and make it excellent it calls that set of dispositions virtues. They are ways of being excellent as human beings. A virtue is a way of being excellent. Can you name some virtues? Patience, kindness, gentleness, faith, love, hope. Those are theological virtues. Things like courage and temperance. You get the idea? So those are what you're, we're focusing on maximizing. You don't focus so much on the action. The idea is, if you're such a good person, if you focus on the person, then whatever actions come out of a virtuous person are going to be virtuous, right? A virtuous person is not going to commit a cruel action or a hateful action or a vulgar, base action. You see, you get the idea? All right. Then we move into political philosophy. The idea here, guys, 
is that ethics is about managing the individual, whereas politics is about managing what? Society. So this is where things get interesting, right? Politics, right? Politics was heated back then in ancient Greece with people like Aristotle and Plato. Oh my God. What Athens was going through, what Sparta was going through, turbulence, nothing but turbulence, very rocky. And what we have now, right? Very turbulent, very rocky. Um, so ideologically, you know, whether you're on the left or you're on the right, it, it, it is very um, good exercise to think how should society be organized so as to maximize flourishing for everyone? Should we be a monarchy with a king? Should we be a democracy? Should we be a republic? Should we be an aristocracy? Should we be a meritocracy? Should we have a constitution? And should our constitution be liberal or conservative? Where do rights come from? Do they come from God? And if they come from God, then what's the role of the government? The government, if we have God-given rights, the government can only enforce our God-given rights. So those are called negative rights, the rights for the government and other people not to interfere with us. But if our, if our rights come from the government, not from God, but from the government, then that's tricky, right? Because if our rights come from government and we vote someone in office who promises us food and medical care and all these things, then those are positive rights. Those are rights saying, look, you government owe me something. See, do you see the difference? Negative rights is you government, stay away. I'm good, protect me from other people, protect my property and my institutions, family, business, church from other people. You see that? That's negative rights. Positive rights is, hey, government, give me. I need welfare. I need social and economic rights. I'm a woman. I'm a minority. I'm LGBTQ. I need rights. Do you see the difference? Does that, does that begin to make you make sense of what's going on in our current ideological climate? Okay. We're gonna explore that using a philosopher known as John Rawls, an American, very great American philosopher. We finally have an American, guys. All right. And we're gonna close the class with a very special kind of philosophy. Do you remember what existentialism is? It's a study of what? Hmm? Yes, purpose and meaning of life. Very good. Existentialism, guys, is related to axiology, except you're not looking at the value of actions or the value of persons. Now you're zooming out like Schopenhauer, and you're saying this life, should I be an optimist about life or a pessimist? What is its value? Leibniz says, everything is great. This is the best possible world. God is great. The world is great. Everything's great. No evil, nothing. Schopenhauer is like, no, 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 no. This world is miserable. It's about as miserable as you can imagine it. I'm a pessimist, and you should be too, because at least pessimism makes you take life seriously. You see that? If you're an optimist, you might go through life a bit too humorous, a bit too witty, a bit too lighthearted. But pessimism forces you to, to confront the deep, darker aspects of life. So there's optimism and pessimism. Those themselves are not quite existential. What makes things existential is when you start to say, what is the value of life? Under what conditions could I figure out that value? And is life worth living? And that's a very subjective thing. You know, for some people, Faith in God makes life meaning, meaningful. For other people, aesthetic pleasures like paganism, you know, devoting yourself to hedonism and refined Epicureanism, maybe that's what makes life worth living. For a philosopher like Nietzsche, maybe constantly uh, accumulating power and expending it in artistic and brilliant, you know, are, uh, beautiful ways, that's what makes life worth, li worth living. You know, there's different ways you can work it out. And we're going to explore some of those. And I think that's a good way to conclude the class because that's the deepest aspect, right? What is my life? What am I going to do with it? And are any of the things that I'm going to do with it that I currently plan to do with it, are they really going to fulfill me? Are they going to make my life worth meaning? 
are they, are they going to make my life worth living? Guys, I hope you're excited about these topics as I am. I can't wait. We've got what now? Um, 13 weeks. We've got a lot to go through. So bear with me, and uh, I appreciate your company. All right. Seven twenty-one. We've got thirty minutes. Let's see if we can do this, guys. I think we can. Here we are. We've already seen this. I hope I'm not too repetitive, guys, but I really want to drill certain things into you now so that when we get later on in the class, it'll be easier for you to, you'll all be familiar with them, and it'll be easier for you to understand what's going on. So this is a bit repetitive, so I'm going to go fast, but these are the lecture notes that I designed for the introduction. And, um, oh, no, we're supposed to do the reading. Hmm. Let me think. We have 30 minutes. Yeah, let's do the reading. So the reading for today was Bertrand Russell, The Value of Philosophy. We're going to look at that. Bertrand Russell, what I had you read for today was Bertrand Russell, The Value of Philosophy. All right, guys, we're going to try our best to either get to the notes today or next time. Please look them over whenever you get a chance. They're going to very, be very helpful in expanding your mind and thinking deeper about these issues. I'm trying to really give you guys as much value as possible because I care. All right. But uh, time is a constraint. All right. Let's go. So here's what's going on. I had you read something called the value of philosophy. Now, the first thing you got to note is that why would we really, in our modern world, be really, really interested in what's the value of this ancient discipline called philosophy? There are two perspectives that Russell talks about that might make the value of philosophy seem deflated, deflationary in our current culture. Can you think of what those two aspects are? What are two, two points of view from which philosophy is a waste of time and a joke? Science, excellent, from science, right? Why? Because if we want the best stories, the best accounts, the best narratives about reality, well, the experts are the scientists. And, you know, maybe there's some residue of philosophy in them, but quite frankly, we don't need philosophy anymore. We don't need to speculate when we can measure. And what the hell has philosophy offered anyway? Did philosophy discover carbon? Did philosophy discover iron? Did philosopher discover stoichiometry? Did it discover chemical bonding? Did it discover ionic bonding? Did it discover covalent bonding? Did it discover gravity? Did it discover electromagnetism? And on and on and on, right? You might begin to be like, you know, what is the value of all this philosophy when science is the most rigorous, and the most useful way of dealing with the world, all right? So science is one aspect. Then there's the other aspect, which is the practical side of things. 
we need to get things done. We live in an economy that depends on people working, a work ethic. We don't have all this leisure like Plato and Socrates to walk around thinking about things. We want our educated young people to graduate as soon as possible so they can enter the workforce, begin contributing to the economy, so we can tax them and then redistribute the wealth and build our economy and then repeat the cycle with their children as well. It's like the matrix, right? We're exploiting human bodies for the value that they can offer. So in that kind of climate, all this idle leisurely talk about philosophy, you know, where, where is that going? What's its value, right? What is that all for when we've got busier, more important things to do? So philosophy at some point got a bad reputation. It's kind of innocent now, kind of naive, kind of like that old senile person who walks around talking about stuff no one cares. Innocent but naive, you know, harmless, but kind of a distraction. Why would you get a degree in philosophy when you could do something that could get you a job in tech or law or medicine? You're making all these distinctions, mind versus body, appearance versus reality. You know, who cares about all these distinctions? It, it, you're, you're focusing on a bunch of petty details and petty distinctions that no one cares about and that don't impact the real practical world. And you're making a big deal, a big controversy out of things that just don't matter. Who cares if there's supernature versus nature, metaphysics versus physics? We can't tell anyway. We're in this apparent world where we're, we're, we're surrounded by phenomena and that's all we can interact with. Who knows if there's a, meta, a metaphysical world? Who knows if there's a beyond? Why spend your life chasing after a dream? Right? All right. So Russell says, hang, hang, hang on, wait a minute. Yes, philosophy has a bad reputation, but he has a comeback. He says, no, wait a minute, let's think about it deeper. All right? So the value of philosophy is to be sought in the effects that it has on the lives of those who study it. I think that you guys doing critical thinking, questioning things, practicing how to argue in a systematic and rational way, engaging in critical discussions and systematic categorizations and organizations of things, I think that habit will enrich your life as I said, way much more than hyper-specializing in some subfield of software engineering where you will appreciate that domain of human activity. It's a very technological domain, but you'll appreciate it. You'll get promoted. You'll make your 100K a year. But there's so much more about life that you might not be curious about and that you might not experience in all its richness and all its depth kind of like the problems we're talking about. Really engaging with the idea that you might have a mind or a soul. Really engaging with the idea that there might be a God. And if there's a God, oh boy, a relationship with that God, with that person, if God's a person, well, a relationship with him, if he's the creator and the omni, omniscient, omnipotent creator of the universe, a relationship with him should be a top priority. We're talking about wisdom here, guys. Let's face it. <laughs> All these other people are distractions, right? If that God exists, then you should be spending all your time on him. That's why Muslims pray five times a day. A day. It's not because Sharia law is so oppressive. No, no, no. It's because as you go through your life daily, you're constantly being distracted by business and family and this and that. But when you hear that call to go back to God and pray, you're being reminded of what you really need to be paying attention to, or what your mind should, should truly be absorbed with, its true object, or its highest object, all right? So the value of philosophy lies in those things like open-mindedness, expanding your horizons, and cultivating a disposition of curiosity, and wonder, and imagination. And those values of curiosity and wonder and imagination, I want to argue, are even more important 
than the scientific values of what? Accuracy and precision and infallibility. What is infallibility? Yeah, exactly. The, the inability to be wrong. All right. So Russell goes on. He says, if we think about it, there's a distinction to be made. There are the goods of the body, things like food, clothes, medicine. But if we get metaphysical and we have this other thing called a soul or a mind, then there are the goods and services directed at the body, but then there are other goods and services as well, right? That are directed at the what? Yeah, at the mind. What are some of those? Jesus is very clear. He says, man shall not what? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Guys, I want to suggest to you that some philosophy in the history of philosophy has been very scientific, no doubt. It's been all about analyzing stuff and collecting data and all that. That's good. But a lot of philosophy, starting with people like Pythagoras, Plato, people like uh, Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, Boethius, people like Rousseau, these are religious philosophers. You're not going to get rid of the religious dimensions of philosophy. People have tried and they failed. People like the logical positivists, the Vienna Circle. You know, one of the biggest sins in the Christian community is pride. Like, God really hates things like sloth and, you know, lust. Those are very ugly. But I remember when I was in a Catholic high school, run by the Opus Dei, the priest would say, you know, those are really, really ugly vices, but the worst vice, the one that really pisses God off, pride. And that's true not just of the Christians. The Greeks had a word for arrogance. You know what it was? Hubris. So the Greeks too had that idea like, whoa, know your limits. Stay within your bounds. Don't cross over to someone else's territory. The gods have their domain and we have ours and everybody needs to stay in their own domain. So the religious aspects of philosophy, we have had many, many religious philosophers. We've had many scientific philosophers, and sometimes we've had both. But I want to suggest to you that religion is relevant to philosophy, and in fact, if you're going to be a full, balanced, harmonious, flourishing human being, you need to explore the philosophical dimensions of, your, of yourself, the scientific ones, and the religious ones. You don't have to believe in religion. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying explore that dimension. And so philosophy, I think, if it were made purely scientific, you would be bastardizing philosophy. You would be making it really impotent and dry and dull, unesthetic. Some of the richest parts of the human soul and the human spirit and all those cares I was telling you about, a lot of those cares are irrational. They're deeply passionate. A philosopher like Kierkegaard believes that faith is a passion. It's the greatest passion, the passion for God, even bigger than the passion of romance. Romantic love is very passionate, but to fear regard, there's something even higher, the passion of faith. All right, guys, so those are the kinds of things that you need to feed your soul with, right? Bertrand Russell, he's an atheist, but even he recognizes that I can't feed my soul on friggin' scientific data from telescopes and satellites and stuff. That's, that's gonna leave your soul dry and thirsty. You need poetry, you need music, you need art. And a lot of the best art has come from where? Where, where do temples come from? Where does beautiful scriptures come from? Psalm 23, John 3:16, the Dhammapada, the Bhagavad Gita, the Analex, Taoism, all of that beauty comes from the human soul and all of that beauty is meant for the human soul. Philosophers, like religious people, are often ministers. They're doing ministry 
They're ministering to human souls. Pythagoras absolutely thought he was doing that. So did Socrates. So did Plato. So did Augustine. All right? All right. So there's the goods of the body, but your life would be miserable and empty if you didn't also look at the goods of the, of the mind. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. The Dhammapada is one of the classical texts in Buddhism. Buddhism says you need to know the Dharma, know the knowledge. Buddhism is made up of three components, the Sangha, the community of believers, the Dhamma, the word, and the Buddha, who is the figure who brings redemption and salvation through nirvana. All right. All right, so let's get real, guys. Russell is realistic. He's like, philosophy has not been very successful in providing definite answers to a lot of the questions it raises. Guys, one of the most beautiful things about philosophy, and perhaps the only real thing, is its questions. Its questions are very poetic, and its questions are perennial. They're so deep that we never get rid of them. Every generation has to cycle through this. All this stuff about God and mind and body and ethics and personal identity and this and that, free will, it's not going anywhere because it's so central to what it is to be human. You can write papers about it in books, but you're never going to settle it because there are other schools of thought, there are other approaches, there are people who are going to make objections against you. See what I'm saying? There's a lot going on. So you're never going to lay down the law and make it final and solve all of this stuff, but you can make contributions to the discussion. So yeah, philosophy has not been very successful in providing answers, but that's not its value. Its value is not in being dogmatic and providing dogmas and creeds. Its value lies in what? The critical thinking, the open-mindedness, the imagination, the curiosity, the wonder, expanding your mind. That's the you have a mind. Some questions are insoluble. But philosophy serves to make us aware of their importance, examine all the approaches to them, and keep speculation alive. That's the real value of philosophy. In a world where science has categorized everything, the only things that exist are metals or non-metals or metalloids. The only things that exist are, you know, particles or atoms or, you know, everything seems rigid and fixed. So anything left over after that, that we can't figure out, science just can't give definite answers. Is there a God or isn't there? There are atheists, there are religious people. You consult philosophy, well, you'll awaken your curiosity and wonder, but you won't solve anything. At least I don't think you will. We haven't yet. So the value of philosophy lies in its very uncertainty. Why? Because uncertainty is provocative. See why it's provocative? It makes you think. Damn, I, I can't figure it out. Is this particle a wave or is it a particle? What is light? Is light a wave or a particle? What is a photon? How can something have wave-like qualities and particle-like qualities? What's going on? As soon as science hits its limits, it gets philosophical. What is an atom? What is a quark? What is a string? Do they know? I don't think so. Its value also comes from the greatness of the objects which it contemplates, right? Things like God, things like the soul, things like beauty, things like goodness, things like truth. Those sublime, magnificent things, they occupy the mind and they expand the mind. You become humble. You're like, man, I'm just this UM student in my, in my fourth year or whatever. I've read a little, but I've got so much more to know. Sometimes humility can be the highest high, if you catch my drift. Being humble, being modest, can feel great. You can feel like you're part of this huge thing that you'll never figure out, and that's OK. Still kind of good, right? Philosophical contemplation is one way of enlarging the self. Guys, we use words like speculation, meditation, 
contemplation, right? Those are typical philosophical categories. Now, Aristotle was writing during the time of aristocrats. They could afford to do nothing, just like the Egyptian priests. All they did was manage the rituals that honored the gods. So they had a lot of free time. They do some mathematics, and this and that. And the Greeks came over, learned a lot from the Egyptians, and took it to a higher level. All of a sudden, with Greek aristocrats, you've got Euclid inventing geometry, as we know it. You've got all sorts of advances in different theoretical branches of knowledge. And Aristotle says contemplation is the best way to exist, just to contemplate the universe as it is. Why? Because to him, as, a, as an aristocrat, he's got this leisure, and he's like, oh, concerning myself with petty things, like how to feed myself or how to expand the economy or politics, military conquests. Remember, if you're a philosopher and you've inflated your soul so long through speculation and contemplation, past a certain point, you're just going to watch things happen around you, and you're going to be like bored or kind of disinterested, right? Because the real drama is not in external things for you. The real drama is in your soul, in your spirit, and reconstructing reality in mystical union with God. Okay? That's the real, that's a real activity. All these other activities are mediocre and ephemeral. They come and they go. But the activity of the soul, that seems to suggest something more enduring. And so the highest activity of the soul is contemplation for him. The universe is magnificent, and the only thing worthy of a philosopher's attention is what? The universe as a whole, contemplating. Does that make sense, guys? Finally, the freedom and impartiality of contemplation leads to justice and action and love and emotion. Guys, Russell is a friggin' atheist. Yet, when he thinks about philosophy, when he absorbs it and its religious dimensions, when they work on his soul, when he massages his soul with religious philosophy, he starts to get poetic. The freedom and impartiality of contemplation. What's the freedom? That's what I was telling you earlier. Freedom from mundane, ordinary activities. You're not absorbed in earning a living. You're not absorbed in, you know, politics or all these things seem tri trivial. Your mind is so expanded and so free that you experience a new freedom and you protect that freedom. And you become impartial too. You become a lot more unbiased. You can see why, right? If you start thinking of philosophy as justice, being fair, that liberals over here, conservatives over here, Democrats over here, Republicans over here, what is a philosopher going to do? Well, one thing he's not going to do is lose his mind and start protesting. That's, that's mindlessness. That's loss of mind. What he is going to do is try to be fair and say, all right, I feel a certain way, but let me be open-minded. Let me be critical. The people over here, they have some principles. They're human. They have perspectives. They judge things a certain way. Same for over here. So philosophy becomes impartial, right? It's about being fair. You see that? So in action, in the actions you perform when you engage with people, you'll become a lot more just. You'll be fair, fair-minded. Say, let's sit and talk and let's resolve this. What do you really want? What do you really care about? What do you really want? What do you really care about? Is there some common denominator? Huh, maybe we can make progress. And then justice in action and love in emotion. Why love? <laughs> this thing called the universe, if you have it as an object in your mind, if it absorbs all of your mind, then what? What happens? You feel love. You feel love for the universe. The same way a religious person would feel love for God. You kind of see, you see why that would happen? The psychology behind the love? This magnificent, sublime, beautiful universe. The way Stephen Hawking might feel about the universe, right? Or Einstein, or, or Newton, or Galileo. They're, they're absorbed in the contemplation of the universe, all right? All right, guys, so it's 7.45. I want to open it up to questions, concerns. Don't worry, we'll catch up. You know, I know we have a lot to read and cover, but, you know, I mean, I 
I mean, give me some feedback. Like, is this style of lesson delivery, is this kind of like, are you liking it? Is this okay? I would prefer a lot more feedback from you, honestly. And please feel free to raise your hand at any time, interject, interrupt. But, you know, do you feel like you can say something about why philosophy is valuable in, in the modern age, in 2020? why it's not some sort of just something from history. Do you feel like you can say that? Yeah. Please, what's your name? Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't know where the class was. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But yeah, no, I like the I'm sorry. I just need to come closer to you. Yeah. there's adaptation. Things are changing, guys. Coronavirus has taught us one thing. Things can change like that. And not because of a hurricane, because of an invisible whatever, you know? Human life is it's fragile. 160,000 people dead since what? March? Human life is fragile, guys. And some people would say precisely it's fragility. The fact that it can go like that should tell you a little something about its value and its meaning and what you should spend your time doing. Bertrand Russell, he was an atheist, but guess what guys? He was a, a high class individual. Him and Einstein and a few others, what did they do? They warned the president about the possibility that the Germans would invent the bomb before Americans. And so they were militant pacifists. They didn't want war, but they said, you should engage in what's called the Manhattan Project. You should figure out a way to invent nuclear weapons so that we could defend ourselves, you know? But they were militant pacifists. And in fact, both of them won the Nobel Prize. You know, they were recognized, honored. It doesn't matter if you're atheist, whatever. If you're philosophical, your soul is full of noble activity, justice, right? Things like justice, things like love things like uh, contemplation and wisdom, right? Some of the finest specimens of human beings have been philosophers. Let's end on that note. Let's do some, uh, some uh, uh, attendance.